February 15th, 1898. The tropical island of Cuba is in the throes of a bloody struggle to win independence from Spain. Off her coast in Havana Harbor, the U.S. battleship Maine stands a nervous sentinel positioned as a safe haven for Americans in the event of an escalation of violence. For three weeks, 350 American sailors aboard the Maine have kept their tension-filled vigil without incident until 9.40 p.m. this steamy Tuesday night. Accident or sabotage? The answer could mean war. America's most famous battle cries. It's a tale of how one ship's mysterious violent end forever changed the fate of two nations and the world's balance of power. By October 1897, the island of Cuba had been transformed from Caribbean paradise into one of the world's major trouble spots. For two years, rebel forces had intensified their bloody struggle to win independence from Spain. To suppress the insurrection, the Spanish general in charge, Valeriano Huayla, turned his wrath upon the civilian population in a brutal campaign known as subjugation or death. His army swept the countryside, rounding up peasants and throwing them into concentration camps. More than 200,000 reconcentrados met terrible deaths in the overcrowded, unsanitary conditions, earning Weiler his nickname, The Butcher. A continent away, the American President William McKinley monitored these events with increasing concern. Appalled at Weiler's savage inhumanity, McKinley was keenly aware of the strategic significance an independent Cuba could play in future U.S. trade and expansion. The president also realized that Spain was well aware of American sympathy toward the rebels, a position that might place Americans living on the war-torn isle in jeopardy. As a precautionary measure, McKinley contacted the North Atlantic Squadron stationed in the Gulf of Mexico and ordered a battleship sent post-haste to Key West, Florida, only 90 miles from Cuba. If more violence should erupt, the ship could immediately be dispatched to Havana to rescue American citizens. The ship he selected for this vital mission was the USS Maine. One of the main reasons for sending a ship to Havana Harbor was to impress the Spaniards and the Cubans in the area with American naval might, and the Maine seemed to be the perfect ship. It looked good, it was long and low, it had good cruising range, it had good speed. It was just about everything you'd want for an independent ship to send to Havana. The USS Maine was among the first armored ships in what was known as the New Navy. Funded in 1886 by a congressional appropriation of two and a half million dollars, the Maine was designed to be distinctive. While most of her predecessors were made of wood and dependent on wind and sails for power, she was made of steel and fueled by her own stores of coal. But above all, at a time when many U.S. ships were designed overseas, the Maine was distinguished for being a completely all-American vessel. The Maine 
symbolizes a new era in naval expansion and also a new era in American overseas expansion. So you have American society, American policy, American politics, and the United States Navy all expanding at roughly the same time and period in history. The Maine cut a proud figure on the sea but left behind a troubled wake. She acquired the reputation for being a hoodoo ship, Navy slang for jinxed. During her construction, a fire raged through her incomplete hull. On one early mission, a storm washed three of her crewmen overboard to their deaths. Hoodoo struck again in July of 1897 when the Maine crashed into a New York pier to avoid colliding with an excursion boat full of tourists. The pier was demolished, but the Maine suffered only minor damage. The consequences would have been much worse had it not been for the unflappable leadership of the Maine's commanding officer, Captain Charles Dwight Sigsby. He was a Civil War veteran who had served in various positions on a variety of ships throughout the U.S. Navy. And when he received command of the Maine, he was as eminently qualified to command a United States battleship as any captain in the Navy list. In addition to his fine reputation as a naval officer, Captain Sigsby was something of a Renaissance man, a published author and noted underwater explorer. The versatile Sigsby would have to summon all the intelligence and sensitivity his talents required for what could prove to be his most dangerous assignment, the rescue of Americans from the political flashpoint, Cuba. Sigsby knew that more than lives were at risk here. American political prestige and economic interests were also on the line. Cuba represented the first step in America's expanding global influence and ambitions. With power, money, and hundreds of American lives at stake, the main answered President McKinley's call and hastened to Key West, dropping anchor on December 15th. There, the hoodoo ship and her crew awaited the orders that would shortly propel them into history. Sea tales will return in a moment. While the Maine waited in Key West for orders from Washington, public support for a war against Spain was catching fire across the United States, fueled by sensational newspaper reports in what was known as the Yellow Press. The chief purveyors of the early tabloid journalism were two power-hungry publishers with a lust for cutthroat competition. The New York World's Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst of the New York Journal. Hearst denounced his nemesis, Pulitzer, as a journalist who made his money pandering to the worst tastes of the prurient and horror-loving. Those words could have applied to Hearst himself. His own mother forbade her servants to read his prurient and horror-filled headlines. These two blood rivals waged their own war for circulation supremacy, and Cuba became their battleground. Hearst and Pulitzer read the American people very well. The brutal policy General Weiler had established in Cuba hurt the American people. These were very repressive schemes and uh, something that uh, read very well, I think, uh, to the American people that had this very high moral code uh, that oppression of this type uh, should not be allowed. When rioting broke out in Havana in January 1898, President McKinley gave the anticipated order for the Maine to depart for the Cuban capital. Spanish officials warned that the presence of an American battleship in Havana would be considered an unfriendly act. But Captain Sigsby's instructions expressed the opposite intent. My orders were to proceed to Havana, 
and make a friendly visit. The situation seemed to call for nothing more than a strict adherence to naval procedure and courtesy. The term friendly visit was a diplomatic term. The main going to Havana was kind of a different idea. It was under the guise of a friendly visit. It was permitted by international law to be done, but in actuality it was there to protect American interests in Havana and uh, to either uh, spark trouble or quell trouble if necessary. At 11 a.m. on the morning of January 25th, the Maine's imposing form appeared at the entrance to Havana Harbor. On the battleship's bridge, Captain Sigsby wondered what to expect, knowing he must avoid appearing hostile while still remaining alert for any possible danger. Sigsby chose a cautious approach, ordering the crew to take up positions not at, but near their battle stations in case of enemy attack. All stood by their posts, ready, waiting. Tension passed from deck to deck as the main glided beneath the guns of the Morrow Castle Fort. procedure occurred without incident. The next day, Captain Sigsby sent a message back to Washington. We have passed the night without excitement. Evidently, the main looks too formidable for trifling purposes. Ever mindful of his sensitive political position, Captain Sigsby followed the protocols of a friendly visit to the letter ordering every appropriate greeting and salute to be exchanged between the Maine's officers and their Spanish hosts. Yet beneath the veneer of diplomatic cordiality lurked suspicion. Captain Sigsby took extraordinary precautions to ensure the safety of the Maine, intensifying the security detail and forbidding his crew to leave the ship. These measures created an anxious mood amongst the crew. One sailor expressed the fear shared by his comrades in a letter to his family. I am ready to do my duty when called on. But I tell you, it is not a pleasant feeling to sit here and think that the harbor is full of mines. Despite the sailor's fears, the likelihood of a mine striking the main seemed remote as the second week of her friendly visit ended without incident. Still, the captain remained vigilant against treachery, posting sentries about the ship and having all boarding visitors searched. But all of Sigsby's efforts to maintain the tenuous peace could not prevent the ill-timed indiscretion of Enrique Dupuy de Lome, the Spanish ambassador to the United States. On February 8th, Cuban rebels intercepted a personal letter from de Lome to a friend in Madrid and leaked the inflammatory missive to the scandal-hungry New York Journal. The letter dismissed President McKinley as a weak and low politician. The journal's publisher, William Randolph Hearst, triumphantly proclaimed it the scoop of the year. The Dupuy de Lome letter led to a great outrage and outpouring of emotion in the United States. President McKinley had been grossly insulted. The American press came out with huge headlines that this was the worst insult the United States had, uh, had ever undergone since its inception. Uh, that Spanish perfidy and uh, Spanish lies stood fully exposed, and the Spanish ambassador uh, was no longer welcome in the United States. It was a huge diplomatic flap. The humiliated Delone resigned. But the American public, inflamed by Hearst's editorials, demanded more. U.S. officials pressed for a formal apology. Spain resisted. Just one week after the loan had been exposed, relations between the two countries continued to chill, rendering the USS Maine 
the lone American force in hostile Cuban water increasingly vulnerable. February 15, 1898. In the humid stillness of the Caribbean night, Captain Charles Sigsby paced the decks of the USS Maine. Satisfied that all was secure and in order, Sigsby retired to his cabin after another long, uneventful day. Under a steamy, overcast sky, Havana Harbor lay almost unnaturally quiet. At 9.10 p.m., the ship's bugler blew taps. With the exception of the sentry's standing watch, the crew of the main turned in for the night. Alone in his quarters, Captain Sigsby put the finishing touches on a letter to his wife. It would never be sent. Sea tales will return in a moment. p.m. on February 15, 1898, a battleship USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor. The blast sent shockwaves through the streets of the city, shattering windows and ripping doors off their hinges. The hoodoo ship had been cursed once again. Sigmund Rothschild, a passenger on the city of Washington, an American steamer in the harbor, witnessed the spectacle from his deck chair. I heard a shot, like a cannon shot. It made me look toward the main. I saw the bow rise a little. After a few seconds, there came a terrible mass of fire and explosion. A black mass. Then we heard a noise of falling material. It didn't take a minute before the bow went down. There was a cry, help, Lord God, save us, help, help. The cry didn't last a minute or two. On board the main, Captain Sigsby, alone in his cabin, was signing off a letter to his wife when the explosion occurred. As I was placing the letter in an envelope, I heard a bursting, rending, and crashing noise of deafening volume. This was followed by a succession of heavy, ominous sounds like tearing metal. The main trembled and lurched. All the lights went out. There was only intense blackness and smoke. Captain Sigsby groped his way through the wrecking strewn darkness. In a passageway, he collided with Marine Private William Anthony, who informed him that the main was sinking rapidly. Sigsby, assuming the ship was under attack, rushed to the highest deck and ordered sentries posted. But he realized that command was futile once he saw the enormity of the disaster. People were just snuffed out. People were horribly burned and scalded. Some of their compartments in the forward end of the ship were thrown completely upside down and backwards on each other, and the men in them were as well. Uh, they fell several decks. Uh, they had their mouths filled with hot ashes. Uh, several were burned horribly. They were blown over the side. Sigsby made out what he called white forms in the water and heard faint cries for help. To his horror, he realized they were his men. And no one can ever know the awful scenes of consternation to despair and suffering down in the forward compartments of the ship. Scenes of men wounded or drowning in a swirl of water or confined in a closed compartment, gradually filling with water. Sigsby shouted orders to lower lifeboats for the drowning men, but only three of the ship's 15 could be reached. 
Meanwhile, other vessels in the harbor, including the city of Washington, joined in the rescue effort, valiantly plucking men from the flaming waters. On board the main, Captain Sigley and several officers stood in the center of an infernal cacophony. As ammunition magazines exploded, an air screeched through the bursting seams of watertight compartments. After several minutes, the Maine's boats, filled with the wounded, returned to pick up Captain Sigsby and the others. It was a hard blow to abandon the Maine. None of us wanted to leave while any part of the deck remained above water. I waited until satisfied that the ship was resting on the bottom of the harbor, and then directed everyone into the boats. I was the last man to leave. As the main slipped beneath Havana Harbor to our underwater grave, Captain Sigsby and the other dazed survivors were taken aboard the city of Washington. Rescuers converted the cruise ship's dining salon into a makeshift hospital, while medical volunteers made a quick assessment of the dozens of wounded. The carnage was appalling. One Spanish doctor tended to the shattered face of the sailor who was muttering, There's something in my eyes. Wait and let me open them. The doctor caught his breath as he realized both of the man's eyes were gone. Soon after the initial blast, Spanish officials boarded the rescue ship, expressing their sympathy and assuring Captain Sigsby that they knew nothing about the cause of the disaster. The captain cited their concern in a telegram to John Long, Secretary of the Navy, that included a plea from Sigsby that all public opinion should be suspended until further report. It was after midnight when Captain Sigsby received the worst news of all, the casualty count. Of the Maine's 350 officers and men, only 94 were still alive. Eight would later die of their wounds. The other 252 had perished, many of them entombed in the sunken ship. Until Pearl Harbor, it would be the largest single loss of American sailors' lives in U.S. naval history. At daylight, Captain Sigsby gazed upon the wreckage that had once been the pride of the U.S. Navy. What had taken nearly seven years to build took less than half an hour to sink. After much reflection, Sigsby sent a secret message to Secretary Long. Maine probably destroyed by mine, perhaps by accident. I presume that her birth was planted prior to our arrival. I can only surmise this. Back in Washington, President McKinley called an emergency meeting with Naval Secretary Long and other cabinet members. While on the streets of America's cities, the yellow press boosted its sails with incendiary headlines. Joseph Pulitzer printed the captain's supposedly secret telegram in the New York world. Not to be outdone, William Randolph Hearst of New York Journal readers a $50,000 reward for information leading to the capture of the guilty party. Hearst won the circulation war that day, selling over a million copies, an all-time high. Agitated by the newspapers, outraged Americans blamed the Spaniards for the main explosion and demanded retaliation. But President McKinley preached patience. We must learn the truth and endeavor, if possible, to fix the responsibility. The country can afford to withhold its judgment and not strike an avenging blow until the truth is known. To quell the hysteria, President McKinley dispatched a court of inquiry to Cuba to determine the cause of the explosion and who was responsible for it. The panel, made up of four senior naval officers, arrived in Havana on February 21st. They immediately began questioning all survivors and witnesses, while
Meanwhile, a team of Navy divers probed the depths of Havana Harbor for underwater clues. Several days of detailed testimony began to cast doubt on the possibility that the main explosion was caused by an accident. According to surviving crew, any likely internal source of the blast, from the boilers to the coal bunkers, had been inspected shortly before taps that night and found to be in safe and satisfactory condition. Meanwhile, the Navy divers had completed their own inspection of the main. They found that some of the bottom plating was bent inward and the ship itself twisted into the shape of an inverted V. Such massive damage, the team concluded, supported the likelihood that the main had been blown up by a tremendous external force, probably a mine. Who would have the motivation to blow up the main? Surprisingly, those least motivated would be the Spanish. A war with the United States would be an unmitigated catastrophe. Those with reason to do that, however, would be the Cuban rebels. The Cuban rebels desperately wanted an American intervention in Cuba, under whatever reason, to throw the Spanish out and uh, give the island independence. However, the Cuban rebels didn't have the wherewithal at all to put together a mine, nor would they be able to approach the ship with the security precautions that Captain Sixby took. The questions were many, definitive answers were few. For the conclusions of this inquiry were about to set off a chain reaction from Washington to Madrid that would be far more explosive than whatever destroyed the main. Sea Tales will return in a moment. conducted its investigation in Havana. Rumors about the main disaster were sweeping every corner of America. Everyone had an opinion on how the ship blew up and what villains must have engineered it. Secretary of the Navy Long noted in his diary where the lines of debate were drawn. If he is a conservative, he is sure that it was an accident. If he is a jingo, he is equally sure that it was by design. Jingo was a term used to describe those who were rabidly patriotic. And no one in America was a more outspoken Jingo than Theodore Roosevelt, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. It is certainly possible that the ship was blown up by a mine. The main was sunk by an act of dirty treachery on the part of the Spaniards. Theodore Roosevelt knew that Cuba and other Spanish possessions in the Caribbean blocked total American hegemony of the area. Uh, to get Spain out of the Western Hemisphere would naturally take a war. And Theodore Roosevelt was all for a war. 